Okay, so we can see from the very first slide, the cover slide, the period we're looking at spans from 1800 to 1914. So a little bit of overlap with where we left off with the end of first wave globalization. And continuing until 1914, which is the year World War I breaks out. It's not a coincidence that globalization 1.0 ends when World War I starts. All right. Now, some of these objectives are going to be the things that have carried along with us. I'll highlight the ones that are going to be new. I want us to know the different components involved in globalization, what globalization means. That goes way back to the intro. Globalization is that closer political, cultural, and economic connection of different parts of the world caused by easier and cheaper communication and travel. This, we're very much going to add learning about new key characteristics of the different stages of globalization. And we're going to learn about the particular, the particular factors that made this stage of globalization possible. we examine 1.0, after we talk about the enablers, we'll talk about what motivated people in this stage largely to support globalization. And here we are also certainly going to have great many consequences of globalization. Not all of these are we going to get in this particular section of notes or module, but this applies to everything we're going to learn about globalization 1.0. This is going to start preparing you for, but we're not really to the stage yet of arguing for or against globalization or making predictions about its future, although all of this will certainly help. So what was globalization 1.0 in terms of its nature? First, it is our earliest example of true globalization. We have contacts between different societies around the world, and those contacts become much more routine. They're happening frequently. They're happening with regularity. A lot of times they're happening according to schedules like steamship schedules, railroad schedules. And the contacts are deeper. This is no longer the Silk Road where only the most expensive luxuries are transported. And by a few number of people, we have more people from a greater number of societies interacting with one another. And much more is being traded. It's not just going to be luxuries anymore. It's going to be things that people consider essential and that they use every day. It's not just luxuries. We're also going to see much more culture being exchanged. It's not that cultural exchanges weren't happening before. Um, if we need any example of that, 
we can think of the legacy of Spanish and Portuguese in Latin America. But now there's more, and especially religion. And again, this isn't entirely new. Uh, Latin America has traditionally been predominantly Catholic because, again, of the Spanish and Portuguese language. But this time, we're going to see different denominations of Christianity, especially carried um, all over the world by missionaries to places like Africa, as I've seen in both of these images. And also language. French and British are going to spread across Asia, and especially in Africa, they will really take hold. And in how people dress, Western dress is also going to take over. I mean, not everywhere and not immediately. We have missionaries here dressed in Western clothing, and the indigenous people are not. But in other places, and this example is from Japan, Western clothing is very rapidly, once it gets there, displaced traditional Japanese dress. Same with hairstyles. Second characteristic, there's a reason the Union Jack was on the very cover slide of this set of notes. It was led by the British. The Royal Navy was a global naval force. It controlled all of the important sea lanes. Those would be places like the Strait of Hormuz, the Strait of Malacca, the coasts of Africa, for example. All of that was patrolled and kept open by the Royal Navy. And the Brits did this for their own good, but for everybody else, there was a benefit. This allowed ships from countries all over the world to travel in relative safety and trade things with other countries. It's very much what the U.S. Navy does today. Again, we don't do it just out of the goodness of our hearts. It's often referred to as enlightened self-interest. It's good for us, but it's good for other people too. And this was kind of the same idea with the Royal Navy. The third characteristic is the second wave of imperialism. So we notice this part from the first wave is over, mostly. We have some very small colonies here um, in South America, French, uh, British, Belize here is also, I should not leave them out, controlled by the British, it was called British Honduras um, at the time. But as we said, when we looked at the end of first wave imperialism, we're going to have new empires, and they're going to be focused on Africa. That will be a lot of what gets carved up by the European powers, also in Asia. And the Netherlands will still be here. Um, the British will be very much controlling in South Asia, right, from what's Pakistan um, on over to what is now Burma or Myanmar. And also what are known as the Antipodes. which are Australia and New Zealand. And Antipodes means kind of at the other end of the earth.
also should point out, and that's why there's that little asterisk there, right? later Japan gets into the imperialism game as well. Japan is here. They will colonize what is now Korea. Uh, they will control what is now Taiwan. And this is we're not talking about the empire that Japan built um, in the lead up to the Second World War. Not, not the same thing. This is earlier. But Japan really won't get to doing this until... Uh, 1904-1905. It's also a much, much more intensive form of imperialism. Remember, in the first wave of imperialism, to the extent that Africa and Asia were involved, it was largely these little trading posts that dotted the coasts as we went. This right, is going to give way to thorough control by Europeans. Very few places are going to escape, like Ethiopia will escape imperialism for a very long time. And it's not just going to be control of these territories. They're going to be um, managed often in great detail by Europeans, and there are going to be many more European settlers moving to these colonies especially in places like Australia and New Zealand, but also South Africa, first the Dutch, and then the British. And so this is what it's going to look like in a bit bigger picture by 1914. So that's what it was, what made it possible. We're going to have various categories of enablers. I know a lot of these are not going to sound exciting. I will do my best to make them as interesting as possible. But in the end, as my favorite writers, G.K. Chesterton said, there is no such thing as, an, as uninteresting subjects, only uninterested people. That's not an insult. That just means... A subject interests somebody, it may not interest you. It doesn't mean there's anything wrong with you or the subject. It just is what it is. All right, but I'll try my best. Business innovations will be one enabler. Technology will be the second. And often students do find that part at least somewhat more interesting. And then... If you were already sick of Enlightenment ideas, sorry, there will be more. These will be a little bit edgier, though. They are very much uh, characterized by a not light sprinkling of racism. Did everybody finish typing those? I thought I heard a key still clacking. Okay. Start with the Bennis. Business, business innovations. And these are going to be corporations. Corporations are a fact of life today. They're all around us. They make the things that we use. They provide most of the services we also consume. But they've not always been here. Modern corporations are a fairly recent invention. Most, throughout most of the history of business, companies had been what were called sole proprietors, right? meaning there is an owner, right? the proprietor. Others were partnerships, which, as you might have guessed, would be a couple of owners. It might have been a father and son in some cases. And these businesses naturally had important limitations. They could only get so big, and they could only have so many resources. The reason that they could only get so big 
and do so much was because there was not a lot of money to be invested in these businesses. You had to start out small because all you had was the money you had. You could grow the business only as profits allowed you to grow the business. And that was a very slow process. And unfortunately, a slow process also means these businesses are going to be limited because they don't last that long. In the case of a sole proprietor, when the owner dies, usually the business is over. If there's a partnership, when one of the partners dies and the money from that partner goes away, the business also typically dies. And business then outlive that death. And so essentially the, the life of the business and the life of the owners um, were inextricably linked before the emergence of the modern corporation. Another thing that kept businesses small um, was just the really striking risk involved in these businesses. Um, if a business failed, right, sole proprietorship, a partnership, um, then its owner or owners could and likely would be held personally responsible for any of the business debts. So if your business went bust, and, um, you could expect maybe to lose your home, right, uh, lose other valuable possessions that you had. Um, and so this really was something that um, put a limitation on businesses. Right? People were uh, afraid of the risks um, and afraid to take chances on building or growing a business. Of course, we do get the emergence of the modern corporation. And as we talk about them, first we need to know what is a corporation. And we hear the term thrown around a lot, but it's not always clear what it means. Uh, really, what a corporation is is actually quite simple. A uh, corporation is a business that has an existence that is independent or separate from the existence of its owners. Um, you've seen these around and you might have thought that a corporation was something that had to be big. And, um, like shown here, a Ford Motor Company or a Netflix or an Amazon or a Google, um, but they don't. Right? Uh, if you've seen any business around town, um, that has LLC as part of its name, that means that it is a limited liability corporation. And, and that is what sets up the independent existence of the business as a separate thing from the owners. And the importance here is that if a business goes bust, right, if the business fails, um, the owners of that business are really only subject to losing their investment in that business. If an LLC goes bust, um, you don't lose your home, you don't lose your car, you don't have to sell valuables, and you just lose the business. Modern corporations also allow for huge numbers of owners. We're not talking anymore about a single owner or partnerships. You can have uh, many, many owners, and this comes through the sale of stock. Um, a stock is just a share in the ownership of a company, as represented by these stock certificates. One for the Ford Motor Company, this would be uh, how many shares of stock you have. This one is 50 shares of stock. And this is a single share of Netflix stock. And if a stock is a share of ownership, then people who own stock are called shareholders. Now, I do want to be clear. In the 21st century, if you own stock, it is quite unlikely that you have some paper copy of stock sitting around in a desk drawer or filing cabinet somewhere, likely you own stock electronically, um, and that's it. And, but for these early modern corporations, stock would have been something on these kind of paper certificates. 
And to give you a sense of the scale um, and the potential for many, many people to own part of a company, Disney today has 1.82 billion shares of stock. So you could imagine, you might be thinking, all right, well, if each stock was owned by one person, that could be 1.82 billion owners of Disney. Um, you'd be right, but you'd also be limiting yourself in the upward share of numbers uh, for some kind of weird and complicated reasons. Um, and the way modern technology works in owning stock, I own 0 0.01281 shares of Disney. Um, so you not only have potentially 1.82 billion owners of Disney, but quite a bit more of that because people can own fractional shares. Now, this is not to be a story about Disney or a bunch of weird numbers that you shouldn't be memorizing, uh, but the story here is that companies can now have just a tremendously large number of separate owners. The other thing that's important is that modern corporations allow ownership from people around the world. Now, you might think that that's something that is only true now when somebody can get on their computer uh, with a SoFi or a Robinhood app uh, or a Schwab account and buy a share of Netflix. But this was true even in the 1800s and early 20th century that we're considering in this time period. Because of this different nature of ownership, modern corporations can get much, much larger, right? which is why when you think about a corporation, you might think about something that is very large. And this has to do with the ability to sell shares of ownership. This allows them to bring in huge amounts of investment capital or investment money. Because again, they can get... Um, an essentially unlimited number of investors from anywhere in, in the world. So you've got from this a global pool of investors and investment money. Corporations can then employ that investment capital in order to grow larger. Not only can they grow larger, but they can also have a much longer lifespan as an entity. For example, um, Con Edison, and Edison here comes from the name Thomas Edison, the uh, American, we like to say, invented the light bulb, right, and lots of other things, um, is a stock that has been traded, meaning bought and sold, in New York City, right, on Wall Street at the New York Stock Exchange, for almost 200 years. And future classes watching this video, um, it might be more than... 200 years. Um, another factor that allows modern corporations to go larger is that they are less affected by risk. Right? And certainly, right? anybody selling stock would tell you that there's still the risk that you can lose your money, but a person can invest in lots of similar companies. Right? If I wanted to invest in entertainment companies. I could put money in Disney. I could put money in Netflix. Um, I could put money in uh, Paramount or NBC or any of these companies that have launched streaming services. Um, and in investing in many several or in many similar businesses, um, I'm aware that some might fail, right, or at least not do very well. Um, and others will be successful, maybe wildly successful, right, as Netflix has been. But what will happen is that if I invest my money in lots of similar companies, I will have a tendency to make money and get richer in the long run. Um, and naturally, this will encourage me, and it certainly modern corporations have encouraged lots of people um, to invest more and more money in corporations. But again, the idea here is instead of putting all of your eggs in one basket, you're able to spread your eggs across many baskets and uh, grow your wealth 
and yes, you'll lose some, but you'll win some, and in the long run, you'll probably win more than you lose, and this will keep you investing in corporations. And just to get a kind of sense of the visually of the effects of this, right? we have um, on the left upper left corner here um, a household weaving business, right? that just employed family members right? uh, in their own home, right, working with their own equipment. What we get with the emergence of the modern corporation is this shift from a sole proprietor model or partnership model to a corporation that it can employ lots of people and lots of much more sophisticated and productive machines compared to this individual. Right? We see the same thing here. Right? A family butcher shop may be a partnership between uh, these two men, maybe a sole proprietorship, right? but it's done in a small setting. Right? When we move to the modern corporation, we can be much larger and just have much, much more scale we see a factory slaughterhouse, right? uh, this one being the American Swift um, meatpacking uh, company. Right. Um, related to corporations um, is the concept of capitalism. And it's really uh, a case of these two things going hand in hand or hand in glove. Um, and you could even kind of have a, if you wanted to, uh, chicken and the egg uh, kind of parlor debate about which came first. We fortunately don't really need to worry about that uh, consideration. We do need to know what capitalism is um, and its role in the corporation. Uh, capitalism is an economic system that is based on three things. One, uh, and first, is the private ownership of property. Uh, this is the idea that people right, and the companies or corporations they form can own property, right? um, not the government. It doesn't mean that government doesn't own any property. America is a capitalist country um, and its government owns lots of property. The national parks, for example, are government-owned property. Uh, post offices are government-owned property. But the idea here is that private individuals and companies can also own lots of property. Uh, property here includes things that we might typically think of. A land, uh, or a parcel of land, um, a home. But it also includes natural resources. So it might be iron mines, uh, it could be oil wells, lots of, lots of things. Um, it also can and certainly is factories, right? so the things that are built on land, right? and railroads, right? including the not just the rails, but the locomotives that operate on those rails. And property here is not something just that you accumulate so that you can show people how much stuff you own. Um, property here is what's known as a capital asset. Um, it is property that can be employed to make more money, right? And here, money and capital mean the same thing. People can invest their money in capital assets like land, like natural resources, like factories, uh, or they can also invest in corporations that own those assets. Which leads us to our third component here. Right. This investment of capital in capital assets becomes a creator of new wealth, right? More capital. And this new wealth or new capital can then be invested again or reinvested uh, to keep right, the capital creation cycle moving and chugging along. It right? is kind of symbolized in this in which people like to think about money as something you can grow. And that certainly is the idea here. You invest in capital assets, those generate more money, which allow you to invest in new capital assets, and the economy grows and grows and grows. And that idea of wealth creation, capital creation, and uh, growth is important because 
um, capitalism and corporations, our two business innovations, helped produce the technology, right? The, the second enabler we're going to consider today. Um, and again, the technology that made globalization 1.0 possible. Uh, and it did this by steering investment towards companies that competed to be innovative right, in terms of technology. They wanted to invent new technologies, improve existing technologies. Right? Um, and they did this not because they necessarily wanted to improve the lives of people and make the world a better place, although certainly some inventors were also motivated by that. But they did it also, and maybe in many cases primarily, to make more money. Uh, they ended up making our lives better. Um, they didn't necessarily do it out of the goodness of their hearts. They did it to make money, but the end result for us is uh, a better life. And as an illustration of this, uh, we have the invention of rolled toilet paper uh, with separate sheets. So as you can see, this is an invention that is patented uh, in 1891. Uh, it was invented to make money, and it did, but uh, I think most of us would agree that our lives are probably better with uh, toilet paper rolls than without, and this is an example of how capitalism and corporations as business in innovations help produce technology. Now, of course, toilet paper is not one of the technologies we're going to talk about as an enabler of globalization. Uh, for those, let's move on. Uh, the first of our enabling technologies is steam power. Um, and primarily what we're going to be talking about is the steam engine. Uh, the steam engine is a lot like our internal combustion engines that power our cars and trucks and school buses today, um, but instead of the fuel being burned inside the engine, it's burned outside um, to heat water to generate high-pressure steam, which then is used to move pistons and crankshafts and gears to generate motive power. You don't need to worry about the technology. I mean, there's a nice illustration here that shows the steam and the pistons and all of that um, and a steam engine. But more importantly, think of the ships that could move under steam power, the locomotives, the trains that could be pulled with steam power. All of this allowed... Um, movement of people, right, materials like raw resources, and goods, finished products, right. on the one hand, in much larger quantities. Right. Ships can get much bigger when powered by steam as opposed to when powered just by the wind. Right. Locomotives can pull far more than horses or oxen and wagons and carts could pull. Steam-powered transport can also move much more quickly, especially, again, as investment flows to companies competing to improve the technology, it gets better and better. As we see in this early image, right, steamships also relied some on sail. Uh, eventually, these go away, and, and the ships are powered solely by steam and later even uh, better technologies. Not only can they move in larger quantities and more quickly, but they can also do so with more predictability, more regularity. An example of this, um, ships become far less at the mercy of winds. Again, in this image, right, we see that early on, wind was still a part of the story, right, and could be important for keeping a ship moving. But right, now ships are less at the mercy of the wind, so we can imagine this ship it might use sail when the winds are strong and favorable, but when the winds die down, it fires up that steam uh, boiler, gets the pistons moving, gets that paddle wheel, or probably in this case there's a paddle wheel on each side, moving, and the ship keeps going, where in the past it would have been stuck waiting for wind. And this allows ships and shipping companies, right, as well as railroads, um, to offer accurate schedules of their arrivals and departures. Right? People can predict when they need to be at a port or a train station to leave. Uh, companies can know when they're going to expect 
the next shipment of something to arrive and when they need to have their product ready to go for a scheduled departure. The world becomes much more regular. Uh, this is where we also see, coming back into the story of transportation, the importance of time. Um, now all of a sudden lots of people need to keep accurate time, not for navigation as before, um, but in order to time their lives to this much more regular pace of transportation. Um, hugely transformative to daily life. The second enabling technology um, might surprise you. It's refrigeration, and it's not that you doubted the importance of refrigeration. Um, I suspect that in all of your homes you have uh, at least one refrigerator. Many American homes have um, more than one refrigerator, sometimes a deep freezer, a chest freezer, uh, many fridges in bedrooms, and refrigeration is a part of our life, but you might not have thought that it was essential for the story of globalization. Uh, but it is very important for globalization 1.0. Yeah. And right, what refrigeration allows, then and now, is for perishable food, food that's subject to spoilage. Right? Fresh vegetables, fresh meat, fresh fruit, um, to be transported over very long distances. In this time period, largely what we're talking about is meat, right? uh, meat from the Great Plains, right? uh, places like eastern Colorado, Nebraska, Kansas, Oklahoma, parts of Texas, right? and farther west into the American West, places where um, ranching then and now is a big deal, farther into Colorado, um, to the west, Wyoming, Montana, it allows ranchers and cattlemen there uh, to grow lots of meat on open grasslands and then uh, butcher the animals and ship the meat or at least transport the, the meat without spoiling to American cities. And, um, South America is also a huge part of this. Brazil, um, Uruguay, um, meat from those places as well could be transported um, around the world. Right. Same story about fresh fruit from the tropics. For America, uh, for the United States, this meant fresh fruit from Central America. Um, for Europe, it might have meant from parts of Africa or Asia. But in both of these cases, whether we're talking about fresh meat or fresh fruit, right, all of these things could now be shipped right, not only across um, land, as we would think of as shipping meat or fruit across the United States, um, but also across oceans. And so now all of these can be moved across oceans, the Atlantic Ocean, Pacific Ocean, and large land masses like the United States, because we've got refrigerated rail cars that can move meat, or in this case, as we see, Pacific Fruit Express. And, and these ships, called reefer ships, um, could transport that meat from South America to places in Europe. The third and final bit of enabling technology we're going to consider is uh, the telegraph and closely related telephone. Uh, the telegraph allowed signals to be carried across wires using electricity, and so this is when you would have things like Morse code and telegraph operators um, sending um, coordinated messages of uh, taps of different lengths to signify letters of the alphabet and then turn those into messages. Um, that was really pretty quickly replaced by the telephone, um, which also carries signals across wires using electricity, but now, um, rather than transferring dots and dashes, it transfers the human voice. Um, and these closely related technologies were crucial for allowing essentially instantaneous communication. You might have some lag, right, even as fast as electricity travels, um, but basically instantaneous communication over incredibly long distances. Now, they wouldn't seem incredibly long to us today, uh, perhaps, but in this time period it would have been almost like magic, right, because we're talking about thousands of miles of distance between people who could now speak um, or even in early stages communicate by telegraph. 
And this brought the world closer than ever before, uh, connections that previously uh, were unimaginable. This image here, uh, the Anglo-American Telegraph Company map, um, established in 1866, and this does happen in this time period around uh, the American Civil War. Cables are laid um, along the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean and connect England, France, Ireland to places in what are now Canada, but also the United States, uh, New York, Philadelphia. Um, and now companies and people in those, you know, across either side of the Atlantic Ocean can now communicate, again, essentially instantaneously. This is huge for allowing personal connection, but also, of course, um, business connections, uh, links investors in London and New York to make stock trades in those various countries. Tremendously important. And that is where we will end today's presentation. Um, when we return to enablers, we're going to be looking at um, the Enlightenment ideas that helped to enable globalization. All right. Well, complete your notes. Once you have completed your notes, be sure to upload them in Canvas, and I will see you in class.